message from the governor, a state of Maine proclamation. Whereas Percival P. Baxter of Portland, Maine served as one of Maine's most preeminent statesmen with multiple terms in the State House of Representatives and Senate, capped by four years as governor from 1921 to 1925, and whereas throughout his long life, Governor Baxter demonstrated support for children, animal rights, women's suffrage, and the deaf, as evidenced by his establishment of the Maine School for the Deaf at his former residence on Mackworth Island in Casco Bay, and whereas Governor Baxter envisioned the creation of a wilderness park at Katahdin to commemorate the centennial of Maine statehood, and whereas, in the words of one Maine historian, Governor Baxter not only inherited the wealth of his father, but also his father's sense of public duty, philanthropic munificence, historic perspective, love of nature, and intellectual curiosity, and whereas the philosophic munificence of Governor Percival Baxter culminated in the gift of Baxter State Park to the people of Maine, a gift of more than 200,000 acres, donated in 28 parcels between 1931 and 1962, including Maine's highest mountain, Katahdin. A gift painstakingly acquired by a man with vision, means, and longevity through extraordinary perseverance. A gift transferred through sequential deeds of trust directing that it be maintained primarily as a wilderness and with the main objective to be forever wild. A gift established to be managed through the independent Baxter State Park Authority, free of the vicissitudes of state politics. A gift secured in perpetuity through the creation of trust funds from his estate to support its operation. A gift from a man who loved the people of Maine and every inch of her soil and was grateful for their support and friendship. A gift cherished today by Maine residents and others and enjoyed by tens of thousands annually in the right unspoiled way, just as Governor Baxter would have wished. Now therefore, I, Paul R. LePage, Governor of the State of Maine, do hereby proclaim August 22, 2012 as Governor Baxter Day throughout the State of Maine and urge all citizens to recognize this observance. Bravo. So you wonder, <laughs> when friends of Baxter State Park realized that this was the 50th anniversary of Baxter's final donation of land to the park, we thought, well, let's have a little celebration. <laughs> and we planned to have a little something in Portland. The minute the word got out, I began, or, and others began, receiving calls. Well, couldn't we do this, and couldn't we do that? And then Dick Anderson said, you have to start the day with the sun rising over the back bay, and at the sundial, and talk about his father. And even in the proclamation, We have so many people here today at the sundial because Barbara's right. When uh, when she first uh, when I first heard about Baxter Day, I said Barbara, Barbara, we got to do something about James Finney Baxter. He was the one that started it all, and he did so many great things for Portland. And so many times I've driven by the sundial with hundreds of cars everywhere and people walking on the trail, and nobody really knows about the sundial. And I think it's been really. It's been great. It's already got a lot of publicity. And here we, here we are, where it all started. This is the only outdoor memorial to James Finney Baxter in the city of Portland. But he did amazing things, like Baxter Boulevard and the Eastern Promenade and the Western Promenade. Uh, he was a, a great mayor back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, Herb Adams, who is the real historian of all things Portland is going to tell us a little bit about James Freddie Baxter and 
actually uh, was able to discover, I think, the original speech that uh, Percival Baxter made when uh, Baxter Boulevard was dedicated right at this spot. So I'm going to just introduce her. He's the expert. If there is a moral to the story of the father and the son, Mayor Baxter and his son Percival, it's that in a single lifetime, the conflict between being a successful politician and a principled person in one body sometimes means it's a struggle. Both of them, in the lives they led, repeated that struggle because the adherence to principle cost both of them their political careers. The building of this boulevard cost James P. Baxter his re-election as mayor. His dogged determination about what he called the Centennial Park, what we call Mount Katahdin and Baxter State Park today, cost Percival Baxter his chance to be nominated for the United States Senate. But the irony, both of whom, uh, both of uh, them were very conscious of it, is that it freed them to do something else with their lives. And we stand here at sunrise at one of the results, Baxter Boulevard, and that sunrise, of course, before it touched us, touched the top of the other monument to that successful life, which is, of course, Katahdin itself and Baxter State Park. These are the words of Percival Baxter in the last speech he gave to the legislature as governor and that he repeated in part in 1925 on the day when this boulevard was actually dedicated. I had the privilege of knowing Governor Baxter when I was about 10 and he was nearly 90. And I would tell you that he would not want to be remembered as a saint in a three-piece suit. He had hard edges, and others bumped them often. He was a practical politician. He was a principled man. And in one person, and in one career, it is hard to be both, as he knew, because he chose between those, and he chose the steeper path. This is what he had to say. Both men and women today have unusual opportunities to enter politics and render service to our state. The danger, however, for the young lies in desire to hold office rather than to render service. Holding office has spoiled many good people who in order to continue in power have been willing to sacrifice principle and honor, and few know when and how to retire gracefully, my father's words of wisdom will ever be remembered by me. He often remarked, every person thus who stays in politics long enough is sure to die disappointed. Some enter political service expecting to accomplish things worthwhile, only to find their efforts blocked and useless. The moment a person displays their independence, you are likely to be confronted by opposition and checked by powerful influences that seek to break you. Hope, courage, determination, ability, and principle are all needed if true success is to be attained. Temptation shall be set before you and plausible argument offered you to abandon your upright course. If you hold yes, out yes, yes. against yeah. these influences on the road, then your path, instead of being strewn with roses, will be beset with thorns. No one should enter upon that road unless you're able to bear your disappointments cheerfully and gracefully. And even though you may not reach the high position to which you once expired, you may fail to accomplish some of that which you set as your goal, then you may at last determine that you have your self-respect. 
every public person should bear this in mind and fight within yourself to overcome this natural tendency. One should never lose the ideals that stirred and prompted you in your youth. I have earned in my career, writes the governor, the respect and confidence of my fellow citizens, and if I have done so, I have been sufficiently rewarded for all my work. I love the state of Maine and all its people, and this affection has increased with every year of my service. The hard things that have been said have long since been forgotten, and there is no one in Maine toward whom I would hold the slightest ill feeling. I am grateful, he writes, for all that has been done for me, grateful that my years as governor have not been marred by scandal. There is much to be grateful for, he writes, and yet there is much I intend to do for my state, he writes to us, because we know the rest of the story. David Starr Jordan says, today is your day and mine. It is the only day we have. It is the day in which we play our part. What our part may signify in the great whole we may not know, we may not understand, but we are here to play it, and now is the time. Percival P. Baxter, Governor of Maine, State Capitol at Augusta. While we have Herb, are there questions you'd like to ask him about Baxter? whose memorial this is, came up with the idea early in the 20th century, about 1905, that it would be a good idea to surround this cove with uh, a public park <coughs> and an esplanade like he'd seen in Europe. The problem was this is where the city sewers emptied out, and a lot of other people owned this land already. His idea was to link it all together and build this drive that you see as part of a, of a citywide park system. Now we ran into plenty of opposition because this would be prime development land. And uh, he argued with friends, he bought from friends, he had the city buy from friends. I'm convinced he bought some stuff himself quietly and donated it to the city. <coughs> and it cost him his re-election. Uh, the people against him said, oh, that's posy, that's exact words, that's all posy. We want practicality, good schools, good roads. So it cost him his election, but it was finished. He was in the first car that was ridden around on the rough path here in 1917, 18, and he died, of course, before it was completed. But his son, Percival, stood near this spot where, I'm not quite sure, to, to make part of, uh, of that speech. So it was vision that cost plenty, and that's how it was done. The story of the father is the story of the son in that regard, because when Percival ran against the wall as far as being able to create Baxter Park, or create Mount Katahdin Centennial Park, as he called it, through the legislature, he said, all right, and he made it his life's work and bought it personally, and got defeated for the U.S. Senate on that basis. So the story of the father and the story of the son is exactly the same. But they'd be pleased we're here at sunrise, I'm sure. Yes. Uh, what years was it that uh, the Baxter family was in England to do research on Maine history? Oh, it was late in the 19th century. Percival was a, a young boy, I think it was about 1885, uh, and he went to school over there. There's some wonderful pictures of little Percival at English boarding school, and they thought because he was an American, he must be a wild Indian. And he actually <laughs> posed 
<laughs> it, it, with feathers and war paint and all of that. He didn't like English boarding school very much. But. So it had been the 1880s, and his father, of course, picked up on all of the, uh, not only the documents he found in attics and archives, but the, the park system over there, and really liked the idea of public parks, as he called them, what, green breathing spaces, green lungs for the city. But in America, of course, there's plenty of open land, so that was a, a fight. To Americans then, open space was empty space. But he came back with the idea that empty open space is uniquely full of something we all need. We just don't see it. And that was their fight, both of them. Can I see another? Yes. Herb, can you tell them about the, the, the bequest to the city of Boston? Oh, James Baxter, Percival was quite friendly and personable. James Baxter was a little more formal. He came from that kind of a background. He didn't always play to the groundlings, but he believed that if you inspired youth in the right way, they would have high ideals. And to him, the idea of doing that would be to have in Boston, the city of our fathers, as he would put it, a, a temple built. He called it the Pantheon to New England, in which there would be a Greek-like temple with great portraits and great statues and great busts of famous people, and you would go there and get inspired, like the Lincoln Memorial today. And he gave uh, Boston X amount of money to be uh, reserved until it reached a uh, million dollars in the bank. And then uh, he would, uh, he ordered the city of Boston to use the bequest to build the Pantheon to New England. Well, it eventually came close to reaching a million dollars, but it had been forgotten. And uh, a, a young person in Maine who, who I'm forgetting, some student, if I'm not mistaken, doing research in the archives here in Portland, rediscovered it and uh, discovered that it had also reached a million dollars. So he said, either you're gonna build the Pantheon to New England or the fallback written into the deed is that the money is used uh, for another purpose in Maine. And the city of Boston uh, said that because Percival had given money to the fund and James, they were technically two separate funds. And even if they totaled a million together, you can't have the money yet. So the fight went on until both sums did total a million, and then uh, Boston had to admit they were never going to build the Pantheon to New England, and the deal was struck splitting the money between Portland, Maine, and uh, Boston, Massachusetts. It's a, quite a story, quite a story indeed. But we're benefiting from it, uh, from it now. And there's still much more good to be done with the money that, uh, that came to Maine. What happened to the money in Maine and Massachusetts? And I don't know what they did with it in Boston, because they figured, you know, even with a million dollars, you couldn't buy a piece of land this big in Boston to build a pantheon to New England in it. So I don't know what Boston did with their money. Portland's used some of it to uh, uh, improve parks, and the rest is invested. Uh, Connie? Yeah, they, um, the money, <coughs> some went to, to Portland, and it was told to spend it right away, and, which they did. And the rest is in a fund in Boston and uh, they spend it on uh, for, uh, Office of New Bostonians, and it educates people on um, America and the principles of America. So that's very much in alignment with his vision. I'm Connie Baxter Marlowe. I'm his great-great-granddaughter. Oh, wow. and, uh, and we actually, I actually went to Boston to, um, we were actually gonna finish off his, his vision and build a pantheon on the web, a virtual pantheon. We went to Boston to try to get the money to do this, and uh, because there is some money sitting in a fund, sitting there, but um, they said they'd give it to us, and then they said they wouldn't. And uh, the, the finance director at Boston actually said that Boston did have a plan for this money. They were going to uh, put this pantheon in, um, in the customs house in Boston and the city of Portland came and, and sued the city of Boston uh, and, and won. It went to the Supreme Court in Maine and they broke the trust and gave the money to Portland and, and um, the rest of the money to Boston that's just really still just sitting there. So it's, um, and he, the re reason he did it was to um, the founding ideals of, of New England. He wanted America to 
he didn't he felt that America would not realize its its true destiny if we didn't have a place to see the founding ideals of the founders of of New England which now look at this mess we're in <laughs> so uh, um, anyway that's um moral of the story is Governor Baxter is still as controversial today <laughs> as some other governors we could name. And he's been dead 40 years and still working for us. So, thank you. Yes. Sir, um, this might be a silly question, but I'm wondering why these people did that. Was it, you know, was it a thing back a while? that people who had money had to share it. I mean, it's it's just amazing how much they did. And is there any why? You know, people like James, who made a lot of money young, some of them did become robber barons, whose purpose was to make more money. James took that money and did a lot of good things with it. And his son, Percival, inheriting the bulk of it, did a lot of good things with it, and they're still being done. You know, I've read everything that I could get my hands on that Percival Baxter wrote. I've searched my little boy memories of the things he talked about to me, and I've talked to others who knew him as an adult. Why did he fix upon Katana? as opposed to like saving coastland or something like that. He comes close to telling us, but he never really says. We know what he did, we know why he considered it precious, he knew what he'd like us to do with it, um, and how he wanted it to be cared for. But what was the kernel of himself that said, it is that, that, that inspires me and I shall hinge my life upon? We don't know. It was a good choice. <laughs> do any of us know? I mean, why do any of us do what we do? Why did you come here at 6 a.m. in the morning? What, what compelled you? What propelled you? What moved you? The governor brings us close to the answer and says, the rest of the way, you have to go yourself. And then he's gone. The governor was not a 6 a.m. fellow, so oh, I don't know. He tells me the governor was not a 6 a.m. No, fellow. No. First of all, liked good meals, staying up late, long conversation, all of that. He, and Connie, thank you for um, sharing that about yeah. your great-grandfather. Um, I should say that um, we have collaborated for this day with lots of people, but Connie has arranged a whole month of activities related to um, her work on the Katahdin and Perot um, relationship and her vision to carry on what she sees as her great-grandfather's um, vision. Thank you. Yeah, one thing, you know, I, you know that Percival actually climbed Katahdin as governor? Yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a whole account of it in the, in the newspaper. Question, Michael. The sundial uh, went up. Um, they they broke the ground in '24 for it, and it went up in '25. And part of the speech I read was Percival's speech upon the dedication of the boulevard, but not necessarily the monument. Why a sundial is a very good question. It it is a working sundial now that they've cut the trees down around it. It really does work, and it was situated perfectly to that point. I think that the granite comes from North J, Maine, uh, which uh, is where City Hall, Portland City Hall, and the pillars and Deering Oaks, 
uh, and Wild Chapel at uh, Evergreen all comes from because it's a nice white granite. Now why they chose a sundial, I don't know, but why they chose the site is because of the father. And there was a, a committee, and Percival was on it, that chose the, that, that the, the, the memorial would be here. Uh, but there's a lot about that that I, I don't know. I read uh, good articles about it, but I couldn't find them at 6 a.m. Uh, to bring together. So, <laughs> but it's, it works. It's actually very nice. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Michael. Good question. Someone approached me when I first came and asked why there weren't plantings and things here, but there are plans for um, restoring this area and Joe to my, from the um, Portland Public Works Department. Come on up and tell us what's, what's in the works. So there's a trust that had monies in it for this uh, monument as well as the uh, Baxter Circle at, at Evergreen Cemetery. And uh, obviously it's in a, kind of a state of disrepair. So we looked at that and um, we thought, well, that's what the money was intended for. So uh, we've actually uh, just contracted with uh, a company to, they've got uh, 75 days from about two weeks ago to refinish this. So they're going to be taking the, uh, the coping stones off of the edge and all of the loose stones. They're gonna be doing it very carefully Everything goes back exactly the same way they found it. It's like a big puzzle. But so basically, they're gonna they're going to repoint, reset. They're going to fix it up real nice, and uh, it, it should look great by the time they're finished. And it should be done. It, it'll be done this fall. Uh, a, a neat point is that there are these two bases on either side of the of the monument. And when Jeff Tarling, who's here with me, uh, my coworker, a lot of you may know Jeff. Uh, we were looking at that and we thought, well, geez, there must have been some lights here, but nobody within the city or anybody we could talk to had any remembrance of seeing the lamps. So Jeff is quite our, he's our little historian uh, within the city and he's got an archive and, and he went in there and found, uh, the only thing we could find was a postcard uh, with an art, artist's uh, rendition of this. Um, and in the postcard were the two lamps. So we took the postcard to uh, our, the Historical Preservation uh, Department and, and uh, so we're going to match those lamps as close as we can and that's part of the renovation project. So there'll be two beautiful lamps that will work. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So the plans are put. And speaking of plans, um, the rest of the day, uh, there's a, uh, it's a Friends of Baxter newsletter on this little table, and that will tell you the schedule for the rest of the day if you don't know. But briefly, at 10, we begin at Mackworth Island to explore all the rich Baxter history there. And then at 2, gather at the Baxter Monument in Evergreen Cemetery and hear from the state historian about the various lines in the Baxter family. At 3.15, Jeff, do you want to come tell us what will happen at 3.15? This is Jeff Tarling. At 3.15, we're going to have a uh, walk at uh, Back to the Woods on Stevens Avenue. And we're going to be unveiling the sign that uh, Baxter State Park has made for uh, Mayor Back to the Woods. So it's the first time we're really collaborating with Baxter State Park, but it's going to be a nice addition. The, the sign crew up there made us a beautiful sign. And, we're going to unveil that at 3.15 and do a little walk. So people will be able to go from Evergreen Cemetery down Stevens Avenue and things. Right across the street. Oh, sorry, right across the street. So yep. park once for two events. Yep. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And um, to have the convergence of the sign, the paint, <laughs> the people. Perfect. Um, Jensen, Jensen Bizzle is going to be here. Jensen was in the park yep. yesterday up on the table land trying to decide how to reroute the trail around Thoreau Springs and he'll be here today. Yeah, so good travel. Coming Thank down you. from the mountain. Um, Howard. Barbara, on the subject of electrification and the lamps that are going to reappear here, wasn't Percival responsible for electrifying Baxter Boulevard? Um, Howard Wickham, who is the Friends of Baxter historian, says that Percival was uh, responsible for electrifying Baxter Boulevard. Years, years after the boulevard itself had been constructed. I see. Years after the boulevard had been constructed. So the lamps, thank you for doing the research.
on the lamps. No, there were no lamps. Then at um, 3.15, at 3.30, it's fully booked, but um, there are docent-led tours of the Frederick Church exhibit at the Portland Museum of Art, but which you can go to at another time, but we've apparently reached their capacity at 3.30. Um, and then there are a few tickets left for the evening event, which happens at the Portland Museum of Art. So, um, uh, Portland, oh, Portland. Portland. Maine, Maine Historical Maine. Society. She's running out of steam here, um, and it's only 6.30. <laughs> but, um, are there other announcements or questions or things people would like to contribute? How many people here have ever been to Baxter State Park? How many people are members of the Baxter family? All right, Connie, <laughs> the early riser of the family. Thank you. A question. Yes. You could introduce uh, the treasurer and yourself and... <laughs> In some capacities, I'm president of Friends of Baxter State Park. We're a non-profit citizen group of about 750 members, and we work to support the wilderness nature of Baxter State Park. And um, I often say, why would a park like that, that has its governing rules, its funds, and its resources, all established, why would it need friends? Well, if you just look at the, what we've heard from Herb about the history of people who try to establish parks and keep them going, I think every park needs friends, and we're a very active group, and I would invite you to learn more about us. We have brochures. Um, Howard Whitcomb is our historian. Um, we have also board members here. Oops, wait, we have a treasurer. Al Howlett is the treasurer. Um, Bruce Hancock is a board member. Bill Bentley is our photographer and former board member and founding member. We have, how many people are members of Friends of Bet? All right. Sarah. And we have our admin manager here who is Sarah Holland. Um, and she can answer questions about us as well. Other omissions, yes. If anybody would like to join friends, I can process memberships right here. <laughs> He's very proud that we now have the square and can do credit cards. <laughs> um, so, thank you all for coming. Um, stay in chat, share more Baxter related stories, and um, have See a you in Mackworth Island. And have a great day. <laughs>